say there's a light at the end of the tunnel And I heard that this night only lasts for a spell But I'm starting to wonder how long I can travel And never get out of this world Here's a man who had a chance to have it all. He is the first to admit that he let that go, that he spent 15 years in the dark, you know, on the dark side. And he's been clean for six years, but he has to start as if he was 19 or 20 again at the very beginning. Thank you. His music is of the caliber of the Don Henleys or the Tom Petty's or the people that write lyrics that are timeless and survive the decades. Jimmy is an important writer in my opinion. He has something to say that's unique, he has a unique voice. He's a tremendous undiscovered talent. I think he's become very wise through his travels and his troubles and it's made him a, an exquisite writer. I think the, the problem with Jimmy is not enough people know about his music. My tears keep on I left Chicago 50 times. My parents were uh, alcoholics and they fought all the time. They were real poor, dirt poor. We lived on the near south side. And I uh, went to the first grade there and then they decided they were going to split up because they just couldn't get along. My dad was always beating the crap out of my mother. and So uh, she decided she was going to leave him. And in order to do that they had to ship me off. So they sent me down to Streeter, Illinois to live with some cousins for a year. So that's the first time I left Chicago. And then I came back a year later and my mother died because I was going to live with her and she died about three months after I came back. So then they put me in a boy's home and the boy's home was terrible. So my father sprung me like he was springing me out of jail. We made, a, we made an escape, you know. After I'd been there a couple months he came by and, and picked me up and we had a plan where we were going to go for a walk. But instead of going for a walk we went straight to the bus stop, took a bus to the train station, got on a train and went to Missouri. So I stayed in Missouri for a couple of years and learned to play the guitar from my cousins. That's where my guitar playing cousins all live. So that, that was my first influence. We came home from church one day and they were already set up and playing in the living room when we got in. And they knew how to jam. They, they were brothers. They've been playing their whole life together. So they knew how to make music together. It was nice. Something about his songs, the way he wrote them, the way he played them, the way he sang them, the way he lived them, that you couldn't argue with. Them. They were true. birthday she gave me two tickets uh, so about six rows back to see Andre Segovia and that was an influence that was a powerful influence at 
the time he was about 60 years old and at the very peak of his game. And he could play that thing. You know, so that gave me some something to set sights on. club called the Boar's Head Inn. It was old blues guys would come in. You know, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee would stop in when they were in the neighborhood and Albert King and all the guys that were playing around them would, would play there. The Boar's Head Inn was the place to play. They'd be playing upstairs, you know, and making $150, $200 a night. And I'd be playing downstairs making $35 a night. But I was 16 years old. That was my introduction to music. South Carolina, that's where I finished high school. It was great. Paris Island was great. As long as you're not a Marine, it's a great place to be. You know, I mean, if, you, if you're in there seven days a week, you know, 24 hours a day, having to toe the line for the Marine Corps, it couldn't be a hell of a lot of fun. But for a high school kid, that's the Georgia Sea Islands. That was good. That was excellent. Actually, I, I hitchhiked back to Chicago, and I played guitar in uh, Old Town. And after about a month, I just asked the guys in Old Town, "Where's the music? Where's it happening?" And this was in 1964, and they said, well, "It's happening in San Francisco." So I hitchhiked to San Francisco, and it was definitely happening in 1964. First place I got out of a car in San Francisco was at uh, Grant and Broadway in the middle of North Beach. And love was only a kiss away I was down at the table Holding aces and nines And anticipating a pretty good time When the dealer drew sells What can I say? Luck was only a kiss away I was playing the coffee and confusion in the coffee gallery in the places along Grant Street. And do we had a little TV show a month after I got there. I was doing a TV show for KPIX. We were just doing social commentary on San Francisco. We wrote a song about Carol Dota. 
when she got her tits enlarged with silicon, and she worked at the Condor. We wrote a, a song called uh, Silly Condor Carol. Silly Condor Carol. There was this old drunk that hung out with us all, named Larry. You know, that's all I knew about him was his name was Larry. And we'd go up to Coit Tower when it was still open to the public, and we'd sit up on Coit Tower, and I'd play the guitar, and somebody else would play the tambourine or whatever. And we'd drink wine and smoke pot and, and bullshit all night long and tell stories. And about three weeks after that, Larry was so drunk that the couple of us had to carry him. One got under each arm, and we were walking down Grant Street. We got to Broadway. As we walked past City Lights Bookstore, I look up, and I got Larry here on one side, you know, with his arm, and he's half gone. And on my right side, there's a hundred books with Larry's picture on it. And, I, you know, I turned to the guy that was holding up the other side of him, and I said, who is this guy? He said, that's Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Don't you know that? I said, no, I didn't know that. You know, so that's the kind of things were going on in San Francisco at the time. Yeah, it was San Francisco guitar Jimmy Smith when I first you know came to L.A., that's what they kind of called me. You know, my nickname has been Sueño since, since 1964. Jimmy the Sleeper was my pool hustler name, Jimmy the Sleeper, because I would sleep between shots. It was disconcerting to someone who had money on the table when the guy he was playing against was snoozing over in the corner. So that was my game. It was like this. I didn't care. He could run 30 balls. I didn't care. It got to be my shot, I'd wake up, go to work. So they, they, the, the old time pool hustlers started calling me Jimmy the Sleeper, so that was my name, so Jimmy the Sleeper. And then when I started uh, doing the same thing in rock and roll bands in the 70s, they started calling me Swain. I said, you know, that's funny that you should say that, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> that seems to be the name I'm stuck with. So that, if I have such a thing as a nickname, it's Jimmy the Sleeper. It felt like everybody knew Jimmy Smith. It was like, whoa, Jimmy Smith, he's really cool. When I finally met him, I was interested right from the get-go. We've been together ever since. That was in the 70s. And little by little, we fit together well. I first met Jimmy at the old Onyx Cafe on uh, Vermont. You know, I walked in and he was playing the guitar and looking real nasty. And, I asked him if he knew a song and he played it for me so pretty, just by itself. He wouldn't have to sing a word and his music would touch you. But uh, when you put it together with the things that he says in his music, he should be on stage someplace big. A lot more people should be able to hear him than hear him now. And in our community, there are those who really, really promote themselves grandly. He doesn't. He just goes about being Jimmy. He can write, you know, a tune, a tune a day, two tunes a day. If you give him a theme, he can write a song to it. Just boom, have it 20 minutes later. It would just stand out. I mean, just far beyond everybody else. His capabilities, his innate sense, uh, knowing what to play, knowing what to leave out. Uh, Jimmy can keep it coming. He can keep it coming. In fact, he's so prolific that I, it's a mystery to me that a record company hasn't seen. Uh, that gold mine just sitting there, waiting to be uh, exploited. Sun man for a warm disposition and all that it's worth and an instant replay of your game plan you keep yourself in good repair for a long time lover that will soon be there if the name and the place and the time is right you can kill your chill and dance Tell me you seem very sincere Why do you think that you need to deceive me When somebody that loves you Is standing right here 
So offer up your shady story And I'll pretend that I think that you're telling me true Just turn my head with a promise of glory Then use me up while I make sweet love to you His legend almost a year before I met him, and then you know, and then I'm starting to check because he's still not the prettiest guy you'll ever meet. But uh, it, it, some quiet place where demons and rainbows met, and you know, there was this this is Haven, and this is where stuff shows up. Jimmy managed to be the space where stuff showed up. Bow goose, whilst he struts on the ground, waiting for the afternoon sun to go down, ain't it nice? Ain't it nice? Ain't it nice? I was having a particularly nice Sunday somewhere in around San Diego, sitting on the front porch, just enjoying myself. And there was some geese out in the yard. And I started singing a song Mama about the geese, you know, Mama Goose and Papa Goose being in love. Three days after I wrote the song, we took it into uh, Columbia Records, where John Hammond Sr. was producing Chad and Jeremy. We printed it, they sold enough copies to where I got some nice checks. It was on the Distant Shores album. Songs that must be sung. I wrote Time is on the Run because it was just, I think, in a closet in New York while we were on tour with Noel Harrison. And I was starting to feel entropy. Entropy always is depressing. I was starting to, to be attuned to entropy. Uh, I was living fast. I was living fast and pretty high for, for you know, a kid from nothing. I was living pretty high. After a while, it just, it seems like, okay, this is it. This is as, as good as it gets, right? Like the movies, this is as good as it gets. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm only 21. I'm only 21 and 22, you know. If this is as good as it gets, I got another 50 years of it getting worse. And I did write a lot of songs concerning time and the passage of time. And Time is on the Run was, I think, one of the first ones. It was the first one of the bunch. So Marty Cooper published that song. And one of his acts was Jennifer Warren. So as soon as he published it and he had the publishing on it, he took it to Jennifer. And um, Jennifer sang it and liked it. And then she did its mother's brother's show a while after that and ran into uh, Donovan Leach. Donovan was going to be on that same show. And he'd heard that song before and he liked it. 
So I guess they wrote out the words and worked on it a little bit or whatever, but they did it together on the Smothers Brothers show. Must be sung. A man I knew as a child, once grown, has never been younger. He yet he believes as his eyes on a watery grave. That he found the way and lost it, I forgot to find the way. Time is of the essence. So, and then Donovan started closing his concerts with it because it was kind of appropriate. He thought it was appropriate at the end of his show. You know, he played his played all of his his tunes from the Donovan records. And then at the end of the evening, he would he would sing them. You know, time is on the run. Gotta go. So that song saw a little action. You know. And I played at the Troubadour one night, and a man from Mercury Records was waiting at the stage exit. As I started to leave the stage, he handed me a check for twenty thousand dollars, and he said, uh, "Just take this home with you, and if you want to do business with Mercury Records, call me tomorrow morning." So I called him in the morning. He says, well, uh, bands are popular, do you have a band? I said, I just so happen to have a band. So we went and made a record. And I thought that the Thorn Shield album, although not a success commercially, was a groundbreaker in a way. I don't think there's anything else of that era that was quite as blending of those folk elements, classical music, and Southern California rock. I don't think there was anything quite blended them that way. Nothing means much to me. And then they brought in an orchestra and watered down the record. Uh, although it suffered in production because the strings and horns were actually mixed higher than our band. You know, the record was just way too soupy for the radio. It just wouldn't go. We cut one more single and we went in and produced our own record, which actually I think sounded better than anything on that album. We went our separate ways. I just started arranging and conducting and and looking for the, the shadows at the back of the band. I spent years just wanting to stay in the shadows. I started hiding. I took over the grunt work of the bands that I was with. There were bad decisions being made on my part. I, I, was, working, I was working with these people because they were comfortable and they were friends. Not because they were good musicians. I figured it, it doesn't matter if they're good musicians, I can always teach them. And I thought of it as I was hiding. I was hiding in the back of the band. But when it came down to the to the deal, the offer wasn't for the band. The offer was just for me to sign. And I couldn't do that. I figured the friendship was more important than the deal. The friendship's more important than the deal. They fired me from that band. Nothing was working. Nothing was working. Somebody offered me a shot at Delauded, and I said, sure, dude. And he gave it to me, and I liked it. And he offered me another one. I said, sure, dude. About three days later, I woke up and I was sick and I called him. I said, what's up? I'm sick. He says, oh, you got the Chinese flu. He said, come on down, I'll fix you up. When you wake up and you're sick and you fix it with a shot of dope, that's kind of an indication that you got a problem. It didn't take long. That was that. I used it every day or so at first. For the last six years, I was uh, using it as often as I could get it, which was usually five or six times a day. And that was my only driving, that was the only thing, of course. That's true addiction. You know, I was out on the street, I didn't live for nothing but my next shot. I was using a, a lot of um, opiate drugs. I'd already worked my way through all of the others. I had a thing, you know, most addicts have a thing about fixing it either using or fixing it. it. has nothing to do with drugs. They're just gonna fix something that's wrong with their life somehow. So they, it's like patchwork. You do uh, uh, duct tape and spit and baling wire and you can heal these psychological wounds with the right kind of duct tape. And one of those uh, duct tapes you know, that stops the leaks is heroin and opiates of other kinds. And I was using a lot of that duct tape because I had a lot of leaks. And the more I used, uh, basically, the more uh, removed from anything that I became. Money didn't mean anything to me then. The only money that meant anything to me was the, the supply money to get my next hit. Uh, instruments have all gone. All of my equipment had gone. All of my possessions had gone. I never really thought either one of us would make it through that. I don't think either of us expected to. I think we both figured we were going to do that until we died. You know, it wasn't until 
about six years ago, five and a half, six and a half years ago, that I started be feeling like perhaps there was a way to, a way to change our lives and to live a better life. So my addiction was who I was. And this physical body that I'm in and all the thought processes and all of the action that I do was geared only to working for and supplying my addiction, taking care of my addiction. That was my primary concern was taking care of my addiction. Uh, there was a, quite a bit of pain involved with not taking care of it. You know, I've described it as a, a, you have an alien in your belly and if you don't feed him he comes nibbling his way out, you know, like in the movie Alien. And then he turns around and looks at you and tells you a bunch of phone numbers where you can get some money. And you run out and get some money and feed him and he goes back away for a while. And so when I was at a place to where I really couldn't do anything else and I needed about hundred and fifty dollars a day minimum I would I had a, a it was seemed like a game it was a hustle I would just go and sit on the curb across the street from someone's house and I would paint a little watercolor they were pretty clearly defined I would paint a person's house with his tree and his car and his driveway his kids playing with his dog in the yard and I put it in a four dollar frame I'd walk over and I'd knock on the door and I'd say, I just painted this picture of your house. And generally, the day before, I would have sold one to his next door neighbor so I could include, and your neighbor just bought one that I painted of his house. You know, I charged $50 for those. I usually could sell, I could do it and sell three a day if I was on, if I was sticking to business. It was 150 bucks a day. That's exactly what I needed. So I, I didn't have a place to live and I couldn't afford a hamburger. But I did have my nut. I did have my three quarters of a gram of heroin. It was what that bought. The lowest part of my life was when I was uh, 109 pounds, my worst, my lowest, was I was 108 or 9 pounds in the hospital, plugged into all of the, the machines, being fed IV uh, drugs. I was in Harbor General Hospital. Again, I had been in the hospital several times from being wounded on the street and being sick and being, and had infections from dirty dope and all kinds of bad stuff. It was real obvious from the way I was walking with a cane, I was barely walking. I was gray, shade of gray, and really, really unhealthy. And it was pretty obvious, even to me at that point, that, that I was going to die pretty soon. I had reached the bottom. You know, I looked like the, the people in Auschwitz in the pictures. Usually, you know, you hear from somebody who heard from somebody who actually saw him and we were all amazed he was still alive. So far, I've survived knife wounds, 40 broken bones, serious burns, a couple of bullet wounds, 20 years of hard drugs. It's just that I managed to stay alive somehow. Cooperate, I try to cooperate with life. I have a survival instinct that's built in. But the thing is, is, it's this that has earned him the undying loyalty of people who are dead. It was Christmas time, and someone offered me an opportunity to come to Florida and make about $1,000. So I went to Florida. And I took a bunch of dope with me so I could actually work and get, because you can't work. You, that's why they call it getting well. You can't work without your dope. It's a vicious cycle and it has only one, one uh, employer and that is the addiction itself. So I took some dope, I went down and I did the work and I got the money. I made a decision to give it all to a motel owner and to keep me until it was gone. So I gave it to a motel owner in Central Florida and stayed in a motel room and uh, didn't use any dough. Didn't sleep for three weeks. I was very sick, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. 
couldn't stand clothes next to my body and went through a, a what they call a cold turkey detox for about three weeks before I slept. And as soon as I slept a few minutes, I felt a little bit better and feeling just a little bit better was enough of a, a window of opportunity for me at that point. Just a little bit, and I mean just a little bit better. And uh, I was elated. I was real happy about that. I knew it was a, an opportunity to feel a little bit better the next day. And then the next day I could feel a little bit better than that. And it was obviously uh, a clear trail to actually feeling better. You know, part of the deal is that you have to get honest and stay honest. You don't have the opportunity to fool with the truth anymore. It's, it's not an option for a recovering addict. Fooling with the truth is not an option because it'll take you back into your addiction faster than dope will. A lot of the stuff that I'm writing and thinking these days is because uh, I have so much contact with people in detox and in places that are, are detoxing from drugs I go in and talk to people a lot. People who are having trouble with the concept of addiction and how they can deal with it, I talk to them on the phone or I go out and talk to them in a meeting. In a meeting, I'll, uh, you know, I'll do what they suggested in the meeting. You search out someone who's a newcomer in the program, you go out and you help them as much as you can. You can't help them with money, you can't enable them to, to continue using but you can tell them what you know about it, and if they hear you, maybe you do them some good. My biggest challenge really is that uh, basically I've been playing my guitar and, and, and doing all of the stuff that I do, writing and playing and singing and stuff like that for the last 35 years. But now I've been clean for five years. So now suddenly here I am wide awake and involved in the world, and I'm 53 going on 54, and I'm old and beat up, and st I'm still, playing my guitar and singing and writing and stuff like that as though I actually had a, a chance of doing that as a profession or as a career. You know, what I'm trying to recover from is not the drug so much as the insanity that goes along with it. You know, and Einstein's uh, definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And here I am doing the same thing I was doing as though I expected different results. It's not always pleasant to be sane, which is why a lot of people seek drugs in the first place. You know, sanity can be, have some rough edges to it. To know what's actually going on around you can be sometimes disappointing. And if I ever get totally sane, I'll never know it. You know, it's hard to recognize from the inside. I don't know if there is such a thing as totally sane. Oh, I've had experience with insane, so I know insane. I'm feeling so blue-minded So do wish that it would rain I'll just be hanging at this station Waiting on this train Feeling so blue-minded yeah, the creativity was definitely repressed, it didn't go away. All that was pent up for a long time and it's expressing itself in a lot of different ways. By this time he had cleaned himself up, he'd come back. We realized that since he was available all the time, and since there were other musicians who believed in his work as well, we might as well put some stuff down on multi-track. We realized that there were some tunes that really deserved to have drums, bass, and piano, the whole works on it. So we started arranging calling musicians that would come over and put down a piano part here and a drum part there and so on. At first it was really quite accidental. We were just archiving new tunes. And then we realized there were so many of these, why don't we put together our own collection? So the idea of actually making a CD crystallized six months after we began recording these arrangements. Finally, when we realized we were actually going to make a CD, we started thinking about what tunes to put on it. The hardest thing about finishing it was, every time we'd get near finishing, Jimmy would write another great song, and we'd have to decide again what goes and what stays. Jimmy has a background in education with music, musical education from UC Berkeley and a lot of study and many, many years of exposure to every kind of music, jazz, church music, pop, rock, everything, blues. Um, he plays just about any style. In Jimmy's case, he knows all these genres so well, he can really leave out all of the extraneous stuff and cut to the chase. What chords and what tempos and what rhythms go with a lyric are very important. 
There's a lot of music that just doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't flow. Part of the secret to getting it to flow is, is having the vocabulary of the rhythm and the tones and the chords and passing notes and all of that musical background to actually tell that story and let it flow. And that's what Jimmy has that's not a unique talent, but certainly one that's valuable. I wrote a song to try to put a little Pollyanna on my day. You say you stay a lot in daydream. That's the best that you can do I never felt too bad for dreamers Because daydreams have a way of coming true You take an ordinary sunset From an ordinary point of view Color it with roses and daydreams Because daydreams have a way of coming true Daydreams have a way of coming true. Daydreams have a way of coming true. Well, first of all, he's he's more than a songwriter. He he is a poet. When I first met him, it was at the. Uh, the old Onyx reading on Vermont. And that was an open mic where they allowed senior songwriters to play as well as poetry. And uh, he became friends with a lot of the poets as, as well as other musicians, of course. Um, so then he started showing up at, at our reading, which was you know strictly of poetry, spoken word reading. But because of his talent that everybody knew that he had, you know, we just occasionally asked him to play us a song. He was so good. And it just kind of became kind of a tradition where now he opens our, our, our reading for us. When I first uh, met him, it was at the Moon Dog, which was a poetry reading. And they did announce that Jimmy was the exception to their rule of poetry. And all I had to do was hear him once to recognize the poetry within the music. He wrote some music for, to back up. And in fact, he helped produce the, my spoken word CD. And he wrote some original music to back up some of my poems. And uh, it's just delightful. As some of you know, this is a house that poetry built. We had no comedians, we have no music, we just have laying down those words. But you know, there is always an exception to the rule. The name of that rule exception is Jimmy Smith. So give a warm hand for Jimmy. I left some of these laying around on the table, and they're, they're just uh, a few poems and things like that that are, are kind of my gift to y'all for tonight. If, if I didn't, if I miss somebody, um, there's, I've got a few more of these little books. They're called Equinox, because that's what it is. It's the Equinox. For 54 years, I have searched for balance. Fire and water, sun and rain, hideous beauty and smiling usurpers, an oxymoron, a reasonable dichotomy of truth a pressure bandage on my leaking faith. I find what I do not seek and seek what I cannot find. I am at peace with war. Vicious love wars break out every now and then. I arm myself and return to the fray. I steel myself to the tears that cover my face, that clutch at my chest when I am assaulted by too much beauty. A sound, a word, a vision. I commit introspection at the drop of a hat or a glove. I can't help it. I miss what I have never had, long for what I never needed, need this longing, need this need to forget, then wash my soul with pain for remembering that I forgot. 
As any other man, I warm my hands by the fire, let myself fall just to feel the vertigo. I cry for justice to balance these scales, then laugh at the prospect. Fire and water, steam and clouds, which return as rain and tears and life. It's equinox. Uh, thank you. Just like I miss a rainy day I miss you, honey Just like I miss a rainy day I get so broken hearted When the sun goes down I get nothing but pity From every woman in town And I miss you, darling Just like I miss a rainy day I still remember I recall your sunny smile that glowing ember stays with me all the while. Back when we started, it was cool and slow. We learned from each other everything we know. Now I'm down in this hideaway, waiting on a rainy day. Play a little mic. to find you look in every place there was to look you're not down on main street or between the pages of a book you're not here in my mailbox or on my internet it's been a long separation but i'm not over you yet and i miss you more than i can say like i miss a rainy day Just like I miss a rainy day Your sweet caresses Never seem to fade away It's been a short road of happy With a long time of slip away One night of good credit With a lifetime to pay And I miss you darling Just like I miss a rainy day I miss you darling Just like I miss a rainy day There's an old saying, writers write, singers sing, players play, painters paint. You link into that very early in life, and an artist that is an artist basically has no choice. If you're an artist, the art has got to come out. It won't take no for an answer. You can be locked away in the deepest foul-smelling prison on Devil's Island. The art is still going to come out. Poets try to ignore their poetry, but it'll come out at breakfast when they're talking to their kids at breakfast. It'll be poetry. It'll come out when they're describing something for their kids. And players play and these days I try to run around enough to where I can make ends meet and continue playing that's my whole job these days if I can pull down a $30 guitar gig okay I'm a happy guy for right now I go out and do it if I can publish a story or something like that and they send me a hundred bucks in the mail keeps me going one more day I'm doing what I love I'm getting paid a little bit enough to stay alive and at times it just seems like I could be working at 
McDonald's and making just as much money on a daily basis and paying my rent and I wouldn't have to, to actually use my mind at all. I could go there and, and push the, the little button that has the picture of the cheeseburger on it. And uh, that's all I have to do is remember what a cheeseburger looked like and I'd be cruising. But I, my mind doesn't work that way. Down by the river, in the cool of the day Watching the river take these heartaches away I can see the reflection of the sun and the sky As they darken and fade As the water rolls by At the bend in the river At the end of the trail we must stand and deliver As we fold up our sails We must answer these questions And then do what we say Cause we're not like the river And we don't get to run away We just wanna run away the bend in the river There's a hole in the sky She will take what you give her And then leave you to cry She will tug on your heartstrings And cause you to bleed Then be gone in the morning Cause she just doesn't need you At the bend in the river Where the love is in pools Standing still for the moment Like the heart of us fools And like fools we believe That this time it will stay And then just like the river Our love seems to run away It just seems to run away Sometimes I just This old junkie, Terry. I want to look like Ricky Martin okay. on this film. We got our work cut out. <laughs> we got our work cut out for it. You must be proud of what you think and you know. You take your opinion everywhere you go. And just because you think it doesn't make it so. So please don't hang that sign on me. I might not be as pretty as your favorite one And I may not be the man to provide your fun But I'll still be at this table when the deal is done So please don't hang that sign on me I might not be the coffee cooling in your glass Or your perennial partner as the seasons pass but I'm really not that villain that you take to task Just look a little closer and you'll see It's a whole new picture from a different view And the way you see it is up to you You will never know what's on the other side of what you can't see through So please don't hang that sign on me You change your mind like you change your sheets you find the same old trouble on a whole new street You give that last man's problems to every new man you meet And please don't hang that sign on me Please don't hang that sign on me